Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. History? Not history. <laughs> welcome back. It has been a hot minute since we have had a Just You and Me episode. We had the fourth anniversary episode, then we had the lovely, fantastic, amazing fan. I said fantastic already, but wonderful Jasmine Brown telling us all about her book. That was wonderful, but I'm happy to be back with just you and me because we are over halfway done with this season. Over halfway done, and I cannot believe it. I feel like the season has gone by so fast, so let's let's savor savor these last, last episodes and let's enjoy this episode. I don't know if enjoy is the right word to use to describe what is going to happen in this episode. I I will leave you to decide if enjoyment is the correct adjective because Spicy TK shows up in this topic, if that gives you any idea of uh, of the vibes of this episode. (laughs) But before we do any of that and dive into our episode, let's get our housekeeping out of the way so first order of business there are still a few spots left for the history bff trip to egypt and i had a few people asking if this is a real trip or a virtual trip and it's a real like actual trip like you and me we're going we're gonna go to head temple we're gonna go to the valley of the kings we'll explore cairo and luxor we'll go sailing down the nile river we're gonna ride some camels it's gonna be great and we're also gonna have a tour guide with us the entire time to help us out guide us through things and to teach us lots of stuff so that's gonna be really really fun so if you're interested in signing up you can go ahead and head to the show notes where there is all the information that you could possibly ever want and need. And the second order of business, there is an accompanying Patreon bonus episode that goes along with this episode. We'll be talking about something called mesmerism and animal magnetism. And this bonus episode features my Uncle Brian, who is a historian. I call him Dr. Uncle Brian, and he basically breaks down this six hour multiple day lecture that he gives on mesmerism and animal magnetism with a side helping of phrenology. He compacts that information down for us in a wonderful episode that is both hilarious, hysterical, and horrific. So if you would like to listen to that episode, you are more than welcome to join us over on Patreon for the extra historical goodness. And our final piece of housekeeping is if you haven't already joined us over on the For the Love of History YouTube, you should definitely do that. We do lots of fun stuff over there. We have live cooking stuff. We have travel bonus content. It is great. You're going to love it. And you can also see these wild hand motions and facial expressions that I do when I'm talking about our topic today because there's going to be a lot of stank face going on. A lot of just staring off into the abyss because of our topic. And with that, housekeeping is closed and Spicy TK has entered the chat. Why are you so spicy today, TK? I hear you asking. Well, dear one, today we are taking a dive into the swampy, putrid waters of the history of hysteria. Now, if you don't know what it is, no worries, you will come to know it and hate it by the end of this episode. And now I must give a few a few warnings before we get into the episode. We will be talking about medical malpractice and it's our our, our usual PG-13 episodes are gonna gonna turn into slightly higher rating. We're gonna be talking about some some not so safe for work things. Now I will try my best to keep things, you know, as tasteful as possible. But if you are ready to get righteously angry with me, then pop in some headphones or Blast this episode on your car speakers, whatever level of chaotic you are feeling today, and let's get to it. Nearly every person with a uterus that I have met has some story of a doctor telling them that their womanly problems are either from their sinful weight gain or their pesky uterus or ovaries playing tricksy games with their hormones. Feel depressed? It's probably your uterus. 
feel feel pain in that uterus it's normal stomach issues again it's probably your little ute ute causing you some anxiety which is making your tummy hurt unexpected weight gain or weight loss it's just that time of month girl you just need to exercise more oh you you can't get out of bed because you're exhausted even though you slept 14 hours? That's weird. Super weird. Have you tried birth control? Oh, birth control gives you headaches and more weight gain and makes you feel dead inside? All right. Must be a you thing. Sorry you were born with inferior sex organs. And the worst of all is it's all in your head. You're just being hysterical. I loathe this word even more now that I know the history behind it. And I just want to say at the top of this episode, if you remember nothing else from today, remember that you're not crazy. Your health is important. And if you're having issues, you are entitled to a second, third, or fourth opinion. Pain is not normal and not everything has to do with weight. And if it is your uterus, you deserve care without judgment. And now I will step off of my soapbox and onto the pyre with which I will burn hysteria to the ground. Hysteria was without a doubt the first disorder specifically attributed to women, a thing that only people with uteruses could get. And it's time to put a penny in the Egypt jar because, you guessed it, the first written record that we have of a womb-based ailment comes from 1900 BCE. That's 1900 BCE in the Cahoon Papyrus. And the cause of the hysteria was a wandering womb. Yes, dear one, the womb enjoys the occasional weekend getaway to body parts unknown, which could cause anything from depression to sudden death. And the only way to cure that wandering womb fever was to not use more cowbell. And if you get that reference, gold star for you, nay, nay, it, the cure was with scent. Yes, my delicious donut, not only was your uterus semi-sentient traveling around your body using your organs like stops on route 66 but it could also smell and on top of that it had scent preferences it would move away from bad smells and towards good smells so what egyptian doctors did to cure you of this wandering womb depended on where your little uti patootie was at. They would put stinky smells under your nose and good smells in your panties to make it travel from the top down to its original position. And if it was too low, then like in your leg or something, then it would put good smells at your nose and bad smells in your pantaloons, which, okay, weird. I know Egyptians have given us the pyramids and beautiful culture and science and amazing monuments that have stood the test of time, but this is a definite L. This is a this is a loss. Put an L in the books, not a win. However, they were not the only ones in the ancient world to have silly goofy ideas about the mysterious and somehow sentient womb. The word hysteria comes from the Greek word hystera, ustera, which means uterus. And that swell fella, Hippocrates, was the first to coin the term. Hysteria permeates Greek medicine and culture. And you can see it in the way Greek women were treated and social structure. And it also appears in mythology. In the National Library of Medicine, the research paper titled Women and Hysteria in the History of Mental Health. The authors write the following. The Argonaut Melipus, a physician and mythological character, placated the revolt of Argos virgins who refused to honor the phallus, refused to honor the phallus, and fled to the mountains, their behavior being taken for madness. Melipus cured these women with hellbore, a kind of flower, and then urged them to join carnally with young and strong men. They were healed and recovered their wits. Melipus spoke of the women's madness as derived from their uterus being poisoned by venomous humors due to a lack of orgasm and uterine melancholy. What? They, they didn't want to submit to the almighty phallus and that made you cray cray? I, 
I just, okay. <sighs> I just imagine a doctor's appointment for women in ancient Greece going something like this. Oh, you poor thing. You're sick. Have some meds and an orgasm that'll cheer you right up and make you less of a killjoy. And blah, it drives me crazy. And I want to say that this is the worst of it. But we're, we're just getting started, dear one. We're like a few minutes into the episode only. So from here, the idea that female madness came from a lack of downstairs disco time with men grew and grew. Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, all these great, air quotes, great men thought that the uterus is sad and unfortunate when it does not join with the male and does not give rise to new birth, meaning having babies. Vomit in my mouth. So not only was having relations with men, important. It was also important. Parative, in fact, to your mental and physical well-being as a womb owner to have children. Once again, grossy gross, gross. Hate that. Thanks very much. The study, and I use that word loosely, of the uterus continued from here, and Hippocrates popped off in his books, writing all about hysteria. According to the paper I referred to earlier, Hippocrates asserted that a woman's body is physiologically cold and wet, and hence prone to putrefaction of the humors, as opposed to the dry and warm male body. Weird. For this reason, the uterus is prone to getting sick, especially if it is deprived of the benefits arising from sex and procreation, which widening a woman's canals promotes the cleansing of the body. He also says that especially in virgins, widows, single people, or sterile women, this bad uterus, since it is not satisfied, not only produces toxic fumes, but also takes a one. I can't. Takes to wandering around the body, causing various kinds of disorders such as anxiety, sense of suffocation, tremors, sometimes even convulsions, and paralysis. For this reason, he suggests that even widows and unmarried women should get remarried and live a satisfactory sexual life within the bounds of marriage. And this, this is the catch, dear one. Within the bounds of marriage. Women were not free to seek their own medication, air quotes, for their frigid uteri, nay, nay. We couldn't have those loose women with their crazy wombs running amok in Greece. According to Hippocrates, they needed to be married to receive life-saving aid, according to them. And I'm so sorry to say that we will be unfortunately coming across this idea of control much more in this episode. In ancient Rome, the ideas of Hippocrates held strong and women's issues were treated in almost the same way. Women, the weaker and apparently cold and moist of the sexes, needed to be treated through regular marital sexual intercourse and procreation, which left no space for bodily autonomy and a choice on whether or not they wanted to have children. The only very lightly sliver of microscopic brownie point that I can give the Greeks and Romans and Egyptians is that the hysteria was purely medical. That was their idea. But when we reach the Middle Ages, things get punishy and very biblical. Have you ever wondered why women seem to be the only ones getting possessed in scary movies? Since I first watched The Ring at a sleepover when I was way too young in elementary school and then The Exorcist and then The Exorcism of Emily Rose and then The Grudge and I'm now realizing that I am <laughs> spilling the beans. Mom, I know you're listening. It's confession time. All those nights that I was at sleepovers with Grace and Emily, I was watching movies that I was definitely not supposed to be watching. And I'm very sorry, but it has helped me in this episode. <laughs> I will digress. What these movies showed me is that women were the only ones getting possessed. And I always wondered why I had more of a chance of possession than the people who had PPs. 
And what was it about me and my other fellow uterus owners that made us so susceptible to the devil? Well, dear one, it may come to no surprise to you now to know that it was the Yudi Patuti itself that made Beelzebub want to just take over our bodies and make us sick. But where did this idea come from? So let's rewind just a little bit to the Greek fella whom I hate with my whole heart. And I, I do not use hate very lightly, but I hate this man. He is possibly the garbagesist of garbage humans in this season. And his name is Aristotle. But TK, why do you hate Aristotle? Glad you asked, dear one. This absolute blight on humanity, who is revered as one of the greatest minds in human history, came up with this asinine idea called the Aristotelian concept of male superiority, wherein free men are biologically and mentally superior to women and enslaved men, which was his way of justifying slavery and treating women like subhumans. And I don't care how much philosophizing and sciencing this man did, that theory of his has caused unimaginable harm and damage to humanity, and I will never forgive him. And if I had a time machine, I would go back in that time machine with a bottle of castor oil, and I would go to his little toga parties, and I would pour that castor oil in his wine. And then he would drink it. And then he would have the bubble guts. And you know what I would do? I would lock all the bathroom doors so that he couldn't get into those bathrooms. And he would poop his little toga in front of all his little friends. But I digress. <laughs> so unhinged. <laughs> Fast forward from Mr. Aristotle poo poo head to the 1200s. The idea of male superiority made its way into theology and medicine. Women were physically and theologically weaker than men. The now St. Thomas Aquinas had a lot to say about this idea and referred to women as. I can't. I can't. Ref he referred to women as failed men. Ooh. Rage. Rage, instant rage, hatred. He also gets the castor oil in his wine. Anyways, he wrote extensively on this topic in his book, Summa Theologica, which is basically an exhaustingly long, frequently asked questions book on the Catholic Church and its teachings. In it, he says women are defective creatures that allow sin into their lives and thus become possessed tools of the devil. And if a doctor couldn't find the cause of your sickness or your melancholy, as it was called, you were definitely being possessed, no questions asked, with a case of hysteria. The devil was in you. You were hysterical. Sorry about it. And this was compounded by the fear of witches and necromancers from the Old Testament that spread like wildfire in Europe and in the 1400s, it hit a fever pitch when Pope Innocent VIII, which is the most ironic Pope name ever, basically declared it open season on witches, aka women, and inquisitors began prowling up and down Catholic countries, putting women through horrendous trials and even putting them to death because of their weakness, their inferior wombs, and their inferior moral spirit. And it is impossible to know how many women were affected by this literal witch hunt. For a brief time in the 1500s, there were a few doctors that were like, whoa, hold up, this is bananas. I don't think that these women are hysterical witches. I think that they might have regular old mental illness. And to those doctors... I retroactively say thank you. Thank you so much. No castor oil in your wine for you. However, fanatical religious beliefs have a horrific tendency to outshine science. And in the 1600s, we have some of the most horrendous cases of murder as a means of medication and control during the Salem witch trials. And if you'd like me to do a full episode on the Salem Witch Trials, I would be more than happy to. But long story short, at the end of all the madness where women were accused of being hysterical, convening with the devil, being possessed, being witches, 
and all sorts of craziness, 19 women and girls were hung for their hysteria and subsequent witchery, and over 100 more were detained against their will. Finally, we reach the 1700s, and for the most part, the witch hunt is over, and science, air quotes, begins to prevail. And I use air quotes for a very specific, specific reason, dear one, because the science in question has to do with something called animal magnetism. (laughs) In the 18th century, with all that witch business in the past and the church put back in its chapel and away from the science people, the link between hysteria and the uterus began to fade and its connection with the mind is created. And when I was researching, I thought, yay, woohoo, finally we've begun to get into real reason from hysteria symptoms, right? No more pseudoscience and, and demons and, and weird theories and wandering wombs. You already know the answer. You know the answer, dear one. The answer is no. No, we do not. And it goes from demon to what the fuck in no time flat. For we have entered the era of weird AF medical quackery. We're not quite at the Victorian era yet, but fear not, we will get there. And we are just hitting all of the classic for the love of history bingo squares right now. We got the Egyptians, we got the Victorians, we got garbage humans. We're, we're having a great time. (laughs) But before we go making fun of those deeply weird people known as the Victorians, we must talk about Dr. Franz Anton Mesmer, apparently. Dr. Franz had identified a liquid in the body called animal magnetism in the late 1700s that had the ability to travel around your body and shrink or enlarge different lobes of your brain. And not like the frontal lobe or the medulla oblongata, which is my favorite lobe in the brain. Nay, nay. The lobes of the brain were the lobes of hope calculation, secretiveness, aggressiveness, love for the home, and the list goes on and on with more than 37 different lobes in the brain according to phrenologists. And we go in a lot of more details about mesmerism and animal, 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 oh my gosh, animal magnetism and phrenology in that interview with my uncle who is a historian. So if you would like to learn more about that go on head over to patreon but to briefly explain our dear dr franz he believed that he could use his magnetized hands to move the animal magnetism fluid around the body and cure women of their hysteria by enlarging and shrinking different parts of the lobe which is a lot more pg than what his predecessors and um, people to come after him would do and here dear one is the time when I will just gently suggest putting in your headphones because our PG-13 program is increasing its rating a bit. All right, are you ready? You okay, you got them? All right, there we go. So literally, for thousands of years, clitoral stimulation was used to ease symptoms of hysteria and it was not considered sexual at all because the only confirmed form of horizontal tango arousal required vaginal penetration no penetration no arousal that's the law okay throughout the 1800s the whole of western medicine believed that only vaginal penetration nope penetration was sexually stimulating for women and physicians were so concerned about the ladies becoming sexually aroused that they discouraged the use of tampons and avoided using speculums or as I like to call them metal duck bills of Satan so as not to arouse their delicate female patients because downstairs disco time sans phallus could result in uterine cancer. You heard that right, dear one. Solo time could give you straight up uterine cancer. And I just need to pause for a second and take a moment to contemplate the uh, the true what the fuckery of all of this. Who, did no one speak to women? Did no one, did like, were we just, we just didn't even talk to the ladies? Like about what they liked or what they disliked? Like what is going on? 
What is going on? I need more information about this. Did they not talk to like writers and poets of the time? Because those raunchy motherfuckers were writing about some crazy stuff in the 1800s. I know for a fact that corn in the 1800s is like, if you want spice, there you go. The Victorians were deeply weird and really sexual. But anyways, existential crisis time is over. It's it's time to move on. Hysteria treatments in the 1800s ranged from hydro douches that were jets of water directed at the at the yoni to steam baths and miniature water wheels that would attach to sinks for... I don't know why <laughs> many of these treatments occurred in European style bathhouses and spas where women were reported to feel as if they had been drinking champagne after receiving their treatments. They were happy as a clam. Oh, that might not be the best phrase to use. I'm sorry. I take it back. They were extremely happy. In the book, Psychology of Sex by Dr. Havelock Ellis, a study estimated that in 1913, 75% of women suffered from hysteria. And one might assume that, oh, they found out about how wonderful and champagne feeling the hydrotherapy was. But that is unfortunately not the case. We're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but it had more to do with the fact that hysteria was such an umbrella diagnosis for literally everything that women really had no no other avenues of treatment. So with 75% of the population of women suffering from hysteria, doctors were simply overrun with patients. The poor things just could not keep up with all the hysterical women that were coming into their offices what were these poor public servants to do? Fear not, my delicious little donut. The Industrial Revolution was right around the corner to save the day. In her book, The Technology of Orgasm, Rachel Maines discusses the order in which electronical appliances were created during the Industrial Revolution, with the sewing machine being the first electronic home device, and then the vibrating massager being the fifth. Beating out the vacuum? By nine years. We had vibrators before we had vacuums. And that is now my Roman Empire. Also in her book, Maine's hypothesized that some physicians used and developed vibrators to treat women with hysteria to save time to avoid straining their hands from the manual massages on the increasing number of patients. She goes on to say that the physicians legitimized and justified the clinical production of hysterical paroxysm, which means orgasm, as a treatment for the disease. And these hysterical women also drove the market for vibrating massagers during the 19th century because these ladies were no dummies, okay? And just as a side note, the first portable vibrator was created by Mortimer Garnville, Garnville and it weighed over 40 pounds, which, which is like 20 kilograms. But he said he didn't make it for hysteria. He made it for female muscle relaxations, which I'm like, okay, Mort, whatever. Sure, sure you did. So as technology advanced, vibrators got small and more portable and the idea of hysteria began to go out of medical fashion as people began to understand mental health more. But the thing that really put the nail in the coffin for hysteria and manual stimulation as a cure was good old porn. Yup, porn. When the vibes began appearing in stag films, which is like early porn in the 1920s, doctors all over Europe and North America made the shocked Pikachu face and said, what? The, the ladies, oh, I, pff, they're actually enjoying this? This is actually sexual gross. How dare you ladies use this medical device for pleasure? Disgusting. And thus, the death of hysteria began, and finally, after thousands of years, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM, in the third edition, finally removed hysterical neurosis in 1980. In 1980. In the 1950s, it was no longer used in clinical diagnoses, but it wasn't removed from the DSM until 1980 which is 44 years ago. What? No. 
What's the math on that? How many years ago was 1980? What? No, no. 43 years and three months. What? Oh my God, I, I did the math when I was writing the script, but reading it again, I'm like shocked. 44 years ago? Oh my God, I'm not surprised. I'm just disappointed. And while this topic is ridiculous and looking at it now, we can laugh, but the repercussions of this asinine disease were awful and they can still be felt to this day. Hysteria was used as a means of control and justification for things like marital rape and treating women as second-class citizens. We can even feel the repercussions of hysteria in the medical field. Women's reproductive health is not taken seriously enough. Viagra has more clinical research than period products do. Just last year, real blood was used for the first time in testing menstrual products. In 2024, in 2024, women were much more likely to be told that their symptoms are just in their head or they're just being dramatic and their pain is just a normal part of being a woman and you just need to suck it up. According to a study by Yale Cardiology, many women hesitate to seek help for a heart attack because they worry about being thought of as hypochondriacs. And this only gets worse when we add racism and medical prejudice against black women and other women of color and people in the trans community. The remnants of hysteria has caused countless women to be misdiagnosed or to go without treatment altogether. Like in the case of MS, multiple sclerosis, for example, it's three to four times more common among women. But until the 1920s, according to Dr. Lisa M. Lines, men were diagnosed with MS more often than women. Because when symptoms were the basis of diagnosis before MRIs were invented, women presented with the same symptoms as men, but they were diagnosed as hysteria. But this prejudice doesn't only affect women. Men face considerable mental health stigma in the aftermath of female hysteria. Weakness, mental illness, and feelings are inherently women's problems. Men are the strong, reasonable ones, and therefore they can't have mental health issues. They've got those good old, reliable phalluses that never feel sad and never need to talk about their feelings and don't wander around their bodies causing all sorts of problems. Misogyny hurts everyone. Sexism hurts everyone and clinicians need to start pulling their heads out of the miasmas and the toxic hysteria vapors and join us here in the year 2024 and finally leave all of that asshole Aristotle's stupid ideas in the past where they belong. We have come to our final thought, dear one, and there is no way on Sobek's sweaty earth that I am going to leave you feeling hopeless. My delicious little old-fashioned honey glazed donut. Okay? Nay, nay. I would never do that. And our final thought for today is kind of a tool and kind of like a general PSA that you can use if you or anyone around you is experiencing diagnostic biases. So John Hopkins University, for anybody who doesn't know, is like one of the top, top medical universities and facilities in like the world. And they've come up with something called the Hopkins checklist. The Hopkins checklist is a series of different checklists that are meant to interrupt biases from doctors and force them to look at a diagnosis in a more analytical way and a safer way. I'm just going to read straight from the New York Times article about how this works because they explain it so beautifully. So here it goes. In spelling out the specific criteria for determining a treatment plan and then recommending one, the checklist interrupts bias in two important ways. First, it disentangles the thinking that goes into medical decision. Typically, clinicians aggregate relevant patient information and use their judgment to arrive at the best course of actions. The, the Hopkins checklist disaggregates that decision into its constituent parts. In a sense, the Hopkins checklist puts the decision about blood 
clot prevention, for example, through a prism, separating out and clarifying the sub-decisions the way a prism separates white light into a rainbow of colors. In illuminating each step, the checklist interrupts habitual biases, preventing them from corrupting the decision-making process. The article goes on to say that the checklist also plays a part in decision support. It's a decision support tool. But of course, it also goes on to say that the checklist cannot replace doctor's judgment, but they can, in many situations, improve it. There are several different types of checklists as well, from mental health to pre-op prep to blood clot prevention. And in this same article, it says the Hopkins blood clot prevention checklist has Enor has been enormously successful. After the intervention, the incidence of potential preventable blood clots in medical patients dropped to zero. The checklist is now a standard of care throughout Johns Hopkins Hospital, and any patient who enters the hospital for a birth, brain surgery, pneumonia, even psychiatric treatment is assessed for blood clot prevention. That means 50,000 patients a year are receiving treatment. Is it biased by their gender or race or any other factor? Hundreds of thousands of patients have benefited since the checklist was put into place in 2000. Eight. Given the chance of clot-related deaths, that's dozens more women's lives saved and dozens of families who don't lose their mother, sister, godmother, or daughter, and that's just one hospital. Rolled out across the country, this relatively straightforward intervention could save thousands of lives of both women and men each year. Now, this is by no means medical advice, okay? I'm not saying to go through the checklist yourself to self-diagnose. Nope, 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 nope. This is not medical advice, okay? What I am saying is that if you feel that you are getting a biased diagnosis from your doctor or they are just dismissing you, you can ask them to use these checklists or hopefully go to a provider that uses these checklists. Simply spreading awareness of these lists will hopefully help people and in combination with better implicit bias training and research, we can finally free ourselves of these noxious hysteria vapors. And I just, once again, want to let you know what you feel is valid. It's not all in your head and you deserve unbiased care for whatever it is that you're going through. Well, dear one, that is all she wrote. Thank you for letting me get on my soapbox there at the end. I just care about you and I have some personal experience with doctors not believing anything that you say, even though you say that you've done all the things they have suggested that you do, but nothing is working and it's just, you're just tired all the time. And yeah, I have experience with that. So it was a very personal close to my heart issue and I hope that this is not a personal and close to your heart issue I hope that you have never experienced this once in your life and you never experience this ever in your life but if you do just know that you are not alone out there and I am I'm right there with you friend okay so <laughs> thank you for joining me in this episode today I hope you enjoyed is is, is enjoyed the adjective that we're using for this episode I hope I hope Yep. I don't know. I hope you adjectived this episode. And if you did adjective this episode, why not share it to your friend who might also adjective this episode? <laughs> share it with your doctor too. Go ahead. Just, you know, if your doctor's being a little bit of a, an Aristotle, which is my new code word for asshole, just suggest them this episode. And if you're listening, doctor, hey, listen to your patient. Or you can also send this episode to your history BFF or somebody who you think needs to be converted into a history BFF. Applications are always open. If you would like to support the podcast, you can leave a rating and or review. Those are incredibly helpful. I'm trying to get to 200 reviews and ratings by the end of the year hopefully it happens sooner so that would be really helpful if you could do that I, I would appreciate that and if you'd like to support the podcast in other ways you can join us over on patreon you can get some absolutely fantastic merch that I have displayed over here the merch is cute we have stickers now we have pins now we have all sorts of stuff now it's great and also just by being here you are supporting the podcast and I really appreciate it so with that, I will tell you to go do something for yourself. Take good care of yourself. 
go outside, touch some grass, drink some water. Let's do a little sippy sip together, okay? Oh, that's good, H2O. Did you, did you take a sip? Okay, excellent. Thank you for taking a little sippy sip of water. I love you so much, and I will see you next week when we talk about some women of the Mexican Revolution. We're talking about lady soldiers. Oh, I'm so excited about it. Okay, I'll see you later. Love you, bye. Also, Ted is here. Ted is here. She's been sleeping here the whole time. Let me see if I can show you. <laughs> She's been here this whole episode. <laughs> okay. Look at Ted. She's she's been here this whole episode i don't like this intro this is not a good intro okay we're gonna try it again i have no nails on i have these these stubby little sausage fingers no nails what are we gonna do I will do one's best. I will do my best to not pee. That's such a weird thing to say. Say bye. Say bye, everyone. Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Say bye to everybody, Teddy. <laughs> it's a seat. It's so weird. Teddy, what are you doing, my dude? In or out, cats. In or out. You are more than welcome. To have Ted join us. Hi, Teddy. Hello. Hello, Ted. Hello, Ted. Hello, Ted. Please don't show your butthole to the camera, please. We're ladies. We don't show our buttholes to cameras. You can sleep. Yes. Good girl. Good girl. Do I have to pee? No. No, I don't. I think we're good. Ba da ba ba ba. I think we're good. Gross. Gross. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. 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 We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. 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 Hop myself up. Teddy. We're just gonna. We're gonna do it. Progress, not perfection. Progress, not perfection. Progress, not perfection. <sighs> okay. Okay. We're ready. I'm ready. Are you? We're ready. We're ready. Okay, ready. Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK. You're... Am I recording? I wasn't recording. Gosh.